Anita here. Before we get into the episode, I just wanted to give y'all a content warning for discussions of suicide. Hey y'all, you know we're a nonprofit, right? That means we rely on donations from listeners to keep this podcast going. So if you have a couple of dollars to spare because every dollar counts, please consider giving at patreon.com slash femfreak. Also fun fact, in addition to the perks that you'll get as a Patreon subscriber, your donations and contributions on Patreon are also tax deductible because we're a 501c3. So if you want to learn more, if you want to give, please head over to patreon.com slash femfreak. Being Chinese in a white area, that's what this movie's about. At its very essence, it is. Every movie is a Rorschach test. Every piece of music is a Rorschach test. Every piece of art, every, everything that I consume has to go through that prism for me. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and this is the last episode in our series exploring film history by watching and discussing landmark films from the beginning of cinema up through the 1980s. In this episode, we'll be wrapping up the series by diving into what was happening in the 80s politically, cinematically, and discussing Miracle Mile, which was from 1988, directed by Steve DeJarnat, and Catherine Bigelow's 1987 vampire western, it's kind of a western, Near Dark. Ray Daniels. What the hell is going on here? Are you going to take Johnny away from me? Take a nap, because you're going to need all your energy tonight. Silly boy. All right, I am so excited to be joined by two amazing guests. First, we've got our long lost, dearly missed, beloved co host, Dr. Ebony Adams. Have you missed me? Mm, but debatable. Have I missed you? <laughs> Absolutely. Dear I listeners. I can't believe I can't believe I haven't spent like the four years previous. I've never I've never called you doctor. I've just started yeah, doing I didn't that make you. now that you're gone. I know. I didn't make you because it wasn't a big deal. But now that but I'm I love just it. a guest, I demand my props. I, I, I'm into it. I love it. All right. And, you know, more importantly, the person who actually right. knows something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and will we'll give us the goods is Walter Chow, prolific film critic and writer. And I am so honored you would spend time with us Me too. here today. Hey, every anytime you guys call, I will pick up the phone. I'm so grateful to be asked. I'm really honored it's true, to be here. Which is why we do it rarely <laughs> <laughs> to, to really mean it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when we decided to do this series, um, Ebony and I like put a short list of people together that were like would be perfect for this. And obviously you're on the top of the list. Um, you wanted to do the 70s, but too bad. So sad. Carolyn took on that mantle. <laughs> um, so the 80s, it is. So when so there were other decades that were available when we scheduled this. Why the 80s? What, what made you want to talk about this? Well, I. You know, I, I I chose the '70s first because I believe that the, the American '70s were maybe the best decade of film ever, mm. anywhere. Uh, from my 1967 all the way through to 1981 or so, I don't know that. Uh, you know, in my humble but correct opinion, <laughs> I don't know that anyone ever was making better movies than the Americans were during that period of time. Mm. And you know, I've done a lot of study and a lot of writing about it. And the '60s are fascinating to me as well. Uh, you know, particularly the evolution from like literally 1960 with all the horror movies that came out all over the world. On that, almost it seemed like on, on New Year's Day, 1960, we had Psycho and we had, mm. you know, Peeping Tom, all these movies, all, you know, uh, uh, all over the world. Everything changed, Eyes Without a Face. So, so the 60s are fascinating because they go all the way through and then Rosemary's Baby, you know, to Bookend and Night of the Living Dead, all those movies. Now I love the 1950s. I love the studio age. I love all those things. I love the 40s with the noir and the war films. I would have loved to talk about any era of, of film, but those eras are more, you know, even the 70s, I was... I was born in 1973, so I was a kid through most of it. The stuff that's really biological to me, the stuff that's sort of like, you know, a, a ge genetic, almost coded on my blood, are the movies of the 1980s. When I was first old enough to, you know, hitch a ride with, with my buddy's parents or, or my parents to drop us off at the, the you, you know, back in the days before cell phones or whatever, you know, you would get dropped off at the theater, you'd pay two bucks on a Tuesday to go watch a movie, and then you'd call the payphone in the lobby for them to come pick you up. I love that phrasing of biological. Like I, I've, I've not heard it phrased that way, but immediately, I think we all immediately understand what that means. Like the movies that you can't explain. I mean, you pro, you might be able to, but that it doesn't matter. the The actual content of it doesn't matter because it it 
it like imprinted into your soul in some ways, right? Exactly. And th- those are the movies that you always love, even if later you go back to it for whatever reason, it's not good. Or you, you can mm-hmm. see what's wrong with it more clearly as you get older. But the movies that you watch between what, the ages of like 13 and 16 or some, somewhere around there, you know, right when you're developing as a person, you're going through adolescence or whatever, you know, these movies imprint on you in a, in a way that movies I don't think ever do again or anything ever does again. You know, that's when you get your first kiss, maybe, or your first girlfriend or boyfriend, your first whatever. Those experiences are huge. And I think film, you know, during that period of time as well, you know, for me, the 80s and for, you know, whomever, the 90s or the 2000s or whatever, the music, the the the, the scene, the whatever, it'll never be not emotional for you, you know, and, and the way that you approach these things, the way that I approach the movies from the eighties is like emotional. It, 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 it's beyond reason. It's beyond sort of the, this intellectualization of, of, of art, you know, that, that we do as we get older, we kind of look at it critically. Um, it's uh, if you say, Hey man, I just saw RoboCop. I was like, I love RoboCop, but RoboCop X, Y, Z is like, I know I love RoboCop. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know what to tell yeah. you. You know, or, yeah. or like near dark. You say, "Well, near dark, I have some issues with it." You know, you know. And if I were seeing it for the first time as a as an ugly old man, I would feel <laughs> the same way. I would say, "Hey, you know, there's some issues here." But I saw it when I was a suicidal 16 year old, and mm. you know what? It means something to me. Say anything means something to me on a biological level. Yeah, it, it, it's like I can't, I, I I can't articulate almost how important those movies are to me. You know, and I have my feelings hurt when I show it to like my daughter, you know, who's 18 now, but you know, and she's like, look yeah. at the hair, look at the one. I'm like, shut up over the hair. <laughs> <laughs> don't you know that he loves her? Don't, don't you get it? He's an outcast. Don't you get it? I'm an outcast. Don't you understand? So these things become, become internalized. Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. Ebony, are there movies in this era that feel that way to you? Oh, yeah, that absolutely. Are, like, imprinted? And, and I've strong armed you into talking about a lot of them. I think most recently, um, <laughs> Legend, right? Which is a That's film right. like if you did not watch it when it came out, there's there's no way to recapture and like situate yourself in the movie theater of, you know, 1984 and really experience it the way that I did, which is unfortunate for you losers, because that movie, when it came oh. out, it, yeah, you talk about like things sort of biologically affecting oh. you or, you know, being part of like the, rewriting your DNA. It absolutely got under my skin and wrote itself onto me. Um, and another movie from the 80s that is, and Anita, you know this, that is like foundational to my sense of self is aliens, uh, yeah. right? So the fact that I cozied up to Near Dark, a movie I had not seen before, and immediately felt like, oh yes, this is the Cameron Bigelow film industrial complex. I'm gonna be very comfortable with everybody I see on screen. <laughs> and it's got a Tangerine Dream soundtrack, shut up. Like I was into it. Then there was a Tangerine Dream soundtrack for Miracle Mile. And I was like, has Walter been reading my diary? Does he know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, for I, a period of time there, I'm so sorry to talk over you. I was just gonna yeah. just just kind of geek out about over Tangerine Dream. Like yeah. for a period of time, all my favorite movies were, were scored by Tangerine Dream. Yep. They did the keep. They did thief. They mm-hmm. they, they 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 did sorcerer. They did legend. Yep. You know, it's like come on, come exactly. on. Th- three o'clock high. They did three o'clock high. They did you. all of I'm these movies you. from the eighties. I mean, I'm so sorry, Anita. I, I interrupted. No, you. no, please don't apologize. I usually have nothing useful. I'm just <laughs> filling in space. I'm I'm thinking about how. So I'm like you know a, roughly a decade younger than yeah. than both of you ish, and um. So it, like, has, it has been a rough decade. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and it's funny because like, yeah, I could talk about music and movies from my teens that really did what you were talking mm-hmm. about music specifically. Like there's music that I would um, especially a lot of the angry punk music that I loved as a teen that I I can listen to now because of that sense memory. Yeah. But if I if you introduce me to a band that's exactly like them today that I have no relationship to, I'd be like, what is this shit? Yeah. <laughs> like, it just doesn't work. But my big movie is actually from the 80s, and I must have watched it really young, which was Dirty Dancing. Um, and we've never done an episode about Dirty Dancing. I don't know why, but that's the movie that, like, has been with me for fucking ever. Like, I watch it maybe five times a year. It's just, it has that, like, 
it's comforting. Like when I'm sad or sick or whatever, it's always the movie I go to. And that's from, I think, 1987. So I was very, like very young, but it's the one that's just always been around um, and is kind of a part of this decade that we're talking about. Yeah, were you no, f- n- nobody oh, puts Anita in the corner. Oh, people Which is try funny because, constantly like, put Anita I, in the corner. I fucking hate that line, actually. But also, <laughs> I'm the baby of the family. I did have to sit in the corner at the like dinner table, you know, like all of that shit. But it, but there's also relational stuff there. Like my mom loves dance movies. Mm. Like that's how that how I was introduced to it. Right? Is because she loves those kinds of movies, and so I've grown affinity to those movies and that sort of thing. So I think there is. Like so many different ways that we enter into relation with media, right? And how impactful well, that is. Well, I love that you mentioned the music aspect of it too, though, because it's like most of my musical taste, I think I have to owe to movies during this period of time. You know, I remember really clearly, vividly in 1989, going to the theater and watching Say Anything with my friends. And then um, on the way home, we stopped at like Walden Books or something at the mall. And I stopped and I bought a copy of Interview with the Vampire because some. A girl I liked, I think, had been reading it, so I bought that. And I bought the soundtrack, you know, on cassette to Say Anything. So then I went home, and I listened to the Say Anything soundtrack, and I read Interview with a Vampire. I mean, this is so, like, you know, it's it, 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 it's it's heavy geek, but that's now my biology. That, mm-hmm. that, that is now actually, as as my, you know, hormones were going nuts and stuff, and, and, and sending tendrils of pheromones out of the universe, it was pulling back. <laughs> And Rice and Cameron Crowe <laughs> and John <laughs> Look, Cusack. As I the fucking the um um oh my god, it just fell out of my brain. The Brandon Lee The, the Crow uh, The Crow. The Crow was like my fucking jam, right? Like oh, you're just that these soundtrack. you're like these little goth kids and that mm-hmm. soundtrack Actually, the other soundtrack is Lost Boys. So I hadn't oh. seen the movie, but my sister had a poster and the cassette. So she eventually gave me the poster and I became obsessed with this movie before I had ever even seen it mm-hmm. because I loved the soundtrack and like the broodingness of all of it. And then like, obviously I watched it was like, yes. And then this tracks. <laughs> and then 25 years later, you're hosting a podcast and your guest, former co-host is like, imagine it's 1987, a family sitting around the dinner table. One of them says, hey, I'm going to be in a huge vampire movie that's coming out this year. His little brother says, hey, I'm going to be in a vampire movie coming out this year. Jason Patrick in Lost Boys, 1987. Josh Miller, Near Dark, 1987. The whole time I'm watching Near Dark, I'm like, wait, this, is, this has got to be like around the same time as Lost Boys, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. wish I had seen it then. I would have eaten that shit up. I'm loving the image of you, Walter, as like a 16-year-old, <laughs> you know, just like steady crushing on this girl who, you know, oh. mentions Anne Rice interview with a vampire. <laughs> you go to Walden Books, which almost stopped my heart when you said it, because I haven't heard those two words <laughs> in, a, in a hot minute. And I'm just like, I would have been that girl who, on the sidelines of that friend group being like, Walter seems so cool. Oh, my God. Walter seems so cool. I'm going to ask him to borrow his copy of Interview with a Vampire. <laughs> and then I'm going to make him a mixtape and make him fall in love with me. Oh, man. We, we, we would have broken each other's hearts, man. I'm telling you. I can tell right now. Yeah, yeah. J- J- Jenny Wright in Near Dark was my ideal Dream girl is like mm. one of the, the foundational object choices in my head as I was building, you know, the perfect mate. There, there was Olivia Newton John, there was <laughs> Dolly Parton, um, th- th- there was Tippi Hedren, uh, you know. And, and if you meet my wife, she's all three of those people. Uh-huh. You know? And, and there, there, there's Jenny Wright, and it's like, you know, and then she, she's also in The Wall, uh, the, the uh, film yeah. version of the Pink Floyd album, yeah. Alan Parker's The Wall. She plays the, you know, the, the groupie that goes to the hotels, like, you got a big tub, want to take a bath, you know, that's her. Mm-hmm. And I was like, amazing it, it internalized like i'll never not feel like i'm in love with her yeah i'll never not feel the yearning and the longing for her and so you know when i watch in your dark even as a, a as a grown man with two kids and a very respectable not respectable career mm-hmm. I, I i think back you know and i watched this movie i was like man those lo- those summer nights were really long and the feeling mm-hmm. of the sidewalk underneath you when you're sitting out there with the girl that you like um is is uh, is always current for me and the music that i listen to and the and the sadness and the lonesomeness that i felt and the 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 isolation that that mm-hmm. i felt and how nobody really would under could ever understand me 
how you know you go out in the night and you watch the dawn come. It's like all of these images that are ineffable or difficult to describe about childhood that people in the past, you know, Walt Whitman used to write about a certain way, or Charlotte Bronte would write about a certain way. For us, for this generation of people, it's like my touchstones are these cultural landmarks, these cultural moments. You know, my 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 touchstone is like when you know May opens up her vein in in that in that field of Derricks, and he's sucking the blood out of her out of her forearm and tangerine dreams pulsing in the background and that's you know i can write an essay about how you know in the in 1987 we're talking about aids we're talking about drugs we're talking about all these things and near dark is talking about those things as well we're using you know vampirism as an illness or an addiction it's doing those things it's a fascinating piece but for me it's always going to be hopelessly romantic it's going to be the movie that the first time i ever heard the cramps was in near dark and that you know and and the uh Honky tonk scene, a classic honky tonk mm-hmm. scene on on the jukebox that the, the Cramps cover of Fever was playing, and there wasn't a soundtrack that I could get of Near Dark at the time. You know, I think they 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 pressed it on vinyl in the UK or something. I, I can get it, so I would stop the VHS tape, and it can barely read anything. It's not legible. It's VHS. The yeah. resolution is horrible. But I would stop it, and I would try to read what all the music was, who wow. every single one was. You know, I, I I learned about the Cowboy Rides Away. I learned about all this stuff. And, you know, the first time I heard The Replacements wasn't say anything. The first time I heard, you know, uh, uh, Larry Cohen was in Pump Up the Volume. Mm-hmm. The first time I heard most of the stuff that I, re- I, I love today is because of the liner notes on movie soundtracks or, right. or in the end, ends of the credits. And, you know, this was key to that development for me, you know, that sort of cultural, emotional development. And I wanted to be... I wanted to be white. I wanted to be loved by my peers, you know, mm-hmm. all white peers. I wanted to fit in. Mm-hmm. And I saw movies as a really clear way of fitting in. And so in a lot of ways, you know, these movies from the 80s were my best friend, too. The only mm-hmm. group of things that accepted me, that I could imagine myself being desired um, yeah. through, was through these movies, too. Uh, I have a total tangent question. Do it. If movies were your way to try and assimilate to some degree, right, to to be in a very white space is do you feel like uh, I don't know if trauma is the right word, but like, it, do you feel a tension in your career around identity and the fact that this is a thing that is, you know, like was never going to accept you? Yes. <laughs> I feel a terrible tension all the time, uh, you know, and, and I'm not alone in that. You know, I don't, I don't think I'm a unicorn anymore like I used to, but I, I just, I don't feel Chinese enough because I, I, I kind of rejected my culture when I was younger, you know, really young. I don't feel white enough because you look at me and people, you know, the first response is, you know, I hope he speaks English and, mm. you know, whatever. It, it, you know, that's the response I get at, at, out and about. And so, yeah, I don't really, you know. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, is there is there a tension? Because your career is built around, fi- well, we can talk about this later. Sorry, now I'm just like getting all psychological about no, it. Do but it. I, I, well, because I'm like your 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 career is built around these roots, mm-hmm. right? Like that, the the foundation of this work is built around this like kind of unease and this, you know. So I, I feel like, I guess I'm also uh, applying the fact that like I am known for a thing that is difficult for me right and that uh, the roots of what i do as a career are are based on this foundation that's a little bit challenging for me to like connect with sometimes or to feel steady in sometimes yeah i don't know why i keep doing it i don't know why you keep doing it because <laughs> um, you're fucking great at it. <laughs> oh stop yeah no I, I you know i i think the real answer for me is i'm helpless but to write or to look at the world in any other way than the way that i look at the world i'm helpless to it mm-hmm. that that is just the prism through which everything goes for me. And so, you know, someone asked like kind of an ironic question once about, you know, um, well, what's that about? What, what do you think this movie is about when they're challenging, you know, my wanting to find what movies mean or whatever. And, and I said, well, it's about my father and it's about the time I tried to kill myself. And it's about, uh, you, you know, being Chinese in a white area. That's what this movie is about. That's what mm-hmm. every movie is about. Mm-hmm. Every movie, every single movie that I watch is about that. It is. At its very essence, it is. Every movie is a Rorschach test. Every piece of music is a Rorschach test. Every piece of art, every everything that I consume has to go through that prism for me. Mm-hmm. There's no other way that I can do it. And so if I write in another way, if I write in a way that would be easy for people to digest, to, to sort of take in, um, that's not honest. That's not me. And that's what 99% of film writing is, it seems like now, is people trying to appease an imaginary audience. And I was never that. That's what's 
made me never terribly employable. Mm-hmm. But uh, but at the end of the day, I, what I hope is like a little bit of legacy, and I don't need to be famous or rich or whatever. But I would love that for my kids when they're interested finally in what I'm writing, that they can come back after I'm gone, maybe even, and say, "Well, here's about six million words." That he published mm. in his lifetime that show exactly who he was at every step along the way of his development. Um, forget it for bad. And that's what I leave behind. And, that's it. And I, I love that because we have such little room right now for like actual development and growth because of the way that social media has like encapsulated and not a, a, not given space for us to like make errors and mistakes and kind of be bad at things and then like get better at them and so i like that's a I, it's a very beautiful sentiment to be like this is the trajectory of my life through my work in mm-hmm. in a lot of ways oh and and i don't think anybody any any of us in in this room or any room would accept who we were even 5 years ago or or the attitudes that we held 10 years ago or, mm-hmm. or you know that that we are in the constant process. I am more than most. I think of learning, of learning that you know there's certain words that you cannot use. There's certain thoughts that are based on your bias that you have to challenge and not indulge. You know you can't. You have to starve that wolf, right? There's there, there there's all of these things that are just you know. And through writing and through film and through art is in writing about my response to art. It chases all the stuff in the open, and so that I have to I have to deal with it. I have to say, why didn't I like this movie, but I loved that movie? And they're both essentially the same movie, mm-hmm. but one of them has this protagonist, and the other one has this protagonist. So what is it about me that's making me this way? That's mm-hmm. making me you know, respond to it in a, in a different way. And that happened really recently with that new, uh, new, new Asian Canadian Pixar film that came out mm-hmm. with you know, a white guy that writes this review that says, I'm exhausted, it's not for me. Yeah. It's like, well, you probably liked Carrie, you probably liked all of these other movies about young women sort of coming into their power. What is it about this that made you exhausted? And I think that's really the tragedy of that piece is that, you know, I mean, he's it's okay for, not, for you not to like something, but it's not okay for you not to examine why something exhausts you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I just like stuff all the time, but if I have a response like, oh boy, this again, then I really need to sort of check myself and right. say, what is wrong with you? How dare you have a response like, 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 t- be thinking something's tiresome? Mm-hmm. How dare you have that response without challenging it? Mm-hmm. I mean, challenge it. All, all, everything is okay if you say I'm exhausted, and it made me feel wonder why it was that a story about a young Chinese girl made me feel this way, and so I started to really think about other movies that are like this that I liked, and why you know do that. Right, because that's the kind of criticism that's valuable. When you just dismiss something, then what you're doing is you're turning a blind eye and you're biased, obviously, mm-hmm. and everything. But anyway, well, and and if yeah. you can't, I don't know at all what you're talking about. But it, but from the general context of this, if you can't parse through that, then the answer is probably racism or something to that yes. effect, right? Like yes. like if you if you can't actually like put those words down of like this is why it's like when someone makes a racist joke in front of you and you're like, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And then you try to get them to explain it. Like they're not <laughs> yeah. wildly uncomfortable. Right? Why is will, that fun? Yeah. yeah. I will find the link for you, Anita, to that review and um that, that Walter's talking about. And yeah, I mean, when the writer says, I, I knew this wasn't for me, and then, you know, um, I'm I'm exhausted by it. And the implication that because I knew it wasn't for me, um, that, that is a that is a demerit, that is a mark in the column against it. As I, you know, a cisgender white man, it's not for me. And so I no longer have to apply the critical rigor that I would apply to something that I do believe is for me. Yeah, man, fuck off, you know? The white supremacist <laughs> train is never late. I want to go back <laughs> to right. the 80s, so, though. Yeah. And yes. your comment, that Walter, about, right? Let's go back. No, let's not go back there. I would, <laughs> no. I I feel like... I would have been a fucking awesome teenager in the 80s. The 80s, I would have ruled in. I just want to put that out there. Now let's talk about movies. Okay. So (laughs) you're talking about like these films that are, you know, foundational to your sense of self, both who you were and who you wanted to be and how important whiteness was as a cloak um, in those films, right? And I had a similarly impactful reaction to a lot of these same movies um, but also really radically different 
Um, and, you know, we could talk about the ways that that makes sense, right? Because um, like along gender lines, along racial lines, why like I was only able to get so far into certain white fantasies, you know, and then was kind of bounced off. And I think particularly about things like um, John Hughes movies and ones like Pretty in Pink, right? I was obsessed with James Spader, obsessed with James Spader, not because I was attracted to him, but because I wanted to be him. There was something so powerful about what he represented on screen. And he was so similar to the people who held sway in my school. And I wouldn't, I certainly wasn't able to articulate it at that time, you know, that I saw the movie. Like, oh, the reason why I can't quit looking at this picture of this dude in Teen Beat or whatever is not because I want him to take me to prom, but it's because I I want to be him. I want to have what he has. I want to have like his loose kind of you know, relaxed way of owning the world around him. Like, I swear to God, every time he smoked a Benson and Hedges 100 in high school, <laughs> like, I just, I wanted to marry him, you know? But so it, going into watching Near Dark, I just thought, in re-whiteness, there is something so profoundly interesting going on here with this new version of a vampire story that is so divorced from the traditional trappings of that kind of story, right? So it's not set in Europe. It's not set in an urban area. It's not set among the rich or the privileged, right? You know, like there's something really that the film does because it removes um, that mythology from its traditional, you know, home ground that I would love for us to talk about. Because one of the things that, you know, I kept thinking about while watching the movie is whiteness and class. You know, and this this assumption, like the 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 lie is, you know, the idea is, um, okay, if you're an immortal being, you will naturally become rich. You will accrue all of these material goods to yourself. You'll live in some great condo. You know, you will have antiques and whatever. And we here we have Lance Henriksen, you know, son of the South, just looking like. 10 miles of bad road throughout this movie, you know, <laughs> just, you know, like the idea of poor vampires, just like poor shit king of vampires made me laugh so hard throughout this movie. So hard. There's so much meat there to what you said. I mean, most vampire movies are, are, are about land issues, you know, selling my castle and buying a new castle and, <laughs> and having, having pieces of, 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 of my, my old, country's earth in my coffin it's all about land rights and mm -hmm. land ownership and you know vampires are never very far from their land you know they can't be they have right. to be back home and but here is a nomadic vampire group of a family that's sort of cobbled together from need and from desire and that mm -hmm. really really spoke to me when i was a kid because i didn't want my family my blood family at mm -hmm. all you know literally or you know mm -hmm. uh, culturally i didn't want that I wanted to be able to construct my family to say, these are my friends. Right. These are the people that I want to be with. These are the people who understand me and that I want to talk like them and I want to date them and I want to be them. You know, to your James Spader point, I mm -hmm. wanted to be Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the toe headed, blue eyed uh, uh, boy, all American quarterback. I wanted that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to know more about you th th than you about football. I'm going to know more than you about movies and music i'm gonna everything that makes you what you are i'm gonna know more about it than you i'm gonna yeah. be obsessive about this culture that i want to disappear into but i never can mm -hmm. i never never ever can and that schism becomes a real thing for me when i you know go to college not long after the 80s and you mm -hmm. know, i graduated in 91 from high school so that became a real i used to tell the joke that i didn't know i was chinese so i went to college and so it, it's it, it, it's surprise, a very surprise. Oh, it's, it was it was like the the jerk, you know. It's like my skin's always <laughs> going to be this color. So there's I, I had that experience, and I identified like hell with the jerk as well. I, I identify with the vampires in your dark because they're not rich, they're not yeah. glamorous, they're not anything except lonesome and yeah. lo needy and longing for something. I mean, you talked about Joshua Miller. He he wants. I may as his. I saw mm -hmm. her. Right. Imagine what it's like to be st stuck in this the interview with the vampire Claudia right. character, right? Imagine what it's like to be a sixty year old man stuck in the body of a twelve year old. And I, May is mine. She's mine. And later he wants, you know, Caleb's daughter, you know, a little sister. But there's that element of it for me was painful and 
gratifying to watch mm -hmm. to say like there's people who share my longing there's people who share my displacement um maybe i maybe i'm not doomed to be different maybe i could be part of something else and so the, there, there was a summer that i watched near dark and miracle mile and and heathers on a loop wow and it just an endless loop one after another one after another one after another and they all do have something to do with each other they're all about mm -hmm. weirdos and outcasts and and people who dress differently and speak differently and maybe are better read than you you are and, and you know that that have are different and, and mm -hmm. so i realized looking back as much as i wanted to be part of mainstream white culture i recognized there was a difference in me you know and and and, and i was gravitating towards work even as a young kid that reflected that difference i mean mm -hmm. i love i love john cusack of all the 80s stars and spader and all those guys cusack was the one that I loved because he was a weirdo. He couldn't stop talking. He couldn't stop, you know, like me. Yeah, you know, he couldn't stop doing. Uh, you know, he, I don't. I don't want to work for somebody that that uh -huh. makes something. I don't want to make something that works for something. You know, that's him. That became me. That 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 mm -hmm. was like. This is how I want to be. I want to fall in love with a, a brain and the body of a game show hostess. I want to <laughs> give her a pen. I want you know uh -huh. all the things that he was. I wanted to be, and I was him, and 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 the sure thing. Earlier mm -hmm. in the eighties, I was him and Better Off Dead, who was you know trying to kill himself all the time. I was him and say anything. I was him and Gross Point Blank. I am him all the way through his career. Uh, mm -hmm. John Cusack for me is the avatar of the ideal of what I wanted to be in this culture, and that begins all begins in the eighties during this mm -hmm. sort of springtime of my movie going. So one of the things I think I str so um, I w loved Miracle Mile. I had never even heard of it before, and I really was like taken. Mm -hmm. I, I was. I was shocked how much I was swept up into this film. Um, I struggled a lot more with Near Dark. Um, I found it a little more hard to to stay present with. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I want to surface about both of them, and and I'm finding more and more for me, is that like I am less forgiving of like uh, the romantic connections that are based on nothing. I'm much less forgiving in film where it's like, oh, and they just love each other because they talked for two seconds. Like I just, I'm immediately pulled out when that happens. And I'm finding that like, especially older films don't, I mean, lots of modern day films also do this too, but I just I'm, like, I'm so character driven in my desires in in the ways that I connect to to media that in Near Dark, I got so hung up on the fact that I was like, this guy's a fucking tool. And who the fuck is she? She's just like this little pixie nothing. And now they're in love. Like, when did that happen? And I, I, it was so hard for me to appreciate everything else because I was like, I don't care about these people and I don't believe in any of this. Um, not to say like the film isn't without merit, but that was where I got stuck. And I think in Miracle Mile, it's the, it was that, while I was able to get past that because there's so much more happening in that film, that piece of it, I'm like, this guy's a fucking douchebag. And what does she see in him? <laughs> and why is this happening? Why would you ever do any of the things that are happening in this situation? Um, so, yeah. I had exactly the opposite reaction. I had never seen either of these films before. Immediately was at home with Near Dark, you know? Like I saw Jeanette Goldstein's name in the credits and I was like, done already. Eight out of 10 at least, right? <laughs> uh. um, the thing that talking about like the romantic relationships um, in these two films, Anita, I think one of the things, and this is just personal taste. I love lightning bolt attraction, you know? And so I respond to it in a way that precisely because there's no sort of like long drawn out explanation or exploration of what draws two people together, that kind of like instant chemistry between two characters, I will always respond to. And one of the things that I really loved about Near Dark is how it insists upon the erotic in the midst of like filth. You know, like that's I'm a sucker for that stuff. So, you know, in these scenes where um, Caleb is is sucking from uh, May's wrist or even uh, Severn in the bar, you know, sucking from the neck of the, <laughs> the redneck that he's just killed, like the insistence upon like 
the eroticism of the flesh and smell, you know, I just got deeply into. Now, do I care about Caleb and his shit kicking small town in Oklahoma and May and whether they're happy? No, I do not. In the same way that I do not care about, you know, Anthony Edwards <laughs> and his pair were at the bottom of the La Brea tar pits, which, oh my God, so much about <laughs> Miracle Mile. I was not prepared for. I thought, I think I was misremembering it confusing it with something else. And I was expecting a film that was tonally like, um, what's the one, the zombie movie from the 80s in the mall? Dawn of the Dead? No, not Dawn of the Dead. Um, I'll think of it later, whatever. I was expecting like a, a sort of, you know, teen, like a fun, you know, teen kind of, you know, I, I, not what we got, basically, <laughs> not you know, that at all. And it, took, <laughs> it took, you know, a little time to realize that that's not what we were getting. But then once it, you know, shifts into fourth gear, that's it, you know. It's uh, what I was shocked about with Miracle Mile is how unrelenting. Yeah. Like it doesn't it doesn't there's no breathing room. Yeah. There's no pause. It just it's just like, go, 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 go in this way that like. You're like, okay, we're going. That's what's happening mm -hmm. now. And you're just on this journey. I do want to pause and say that Walter wrote a book about Miracle Mile, which I picked up a copy of. Um, if you want to dive more into the, the movie, I'm just going to plug that for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Night of the Comet? Is yes. that what you're thinking of? Yes, the, Night okay. of the Comet. That's yeah. what I was thinking of. Totally different vibe. Yes. Also <laughs> also great movie. Yeah. Totally different vibe. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, yeah, Miracle Mile. Let me, wow. You know, I don't even know where to go with it because it's, again, it's such a personal film for mm -hmm. me. It's like, um, I, it's hard for me to be objective about either of these movies. But I think, you know, to to, to your point, Anita, like both of these are about sort of um, sledgehammer moments of I found my soulmate. And you either roll with it or you don't. You know, like, like with uh, Baz Luhrmann's Moulin Rouge. If you can buy that Nicole Kidman and uh, Ewan McGregor are a thing, that movie is one of the most romantic and beautiful movies ever made. Mm -hmm. If you can't buy it, it's garbage and obnoxious garbage. <laughs> like that. Yes. And so, so there's <laughs> that you know, dichotomy trap. <laughs> yeah. So that's the you know that that that's the struggle because I loved Moulin Rouge. I don't like his other movies so much, but I loved it because I, oh, I got Romeo the romance. Oh, Romeo and Juliet. Well, uh, yeah, I love that one. I, I I I didn't get Claire Danes. But that then. also, I bet I you that's an imprinting. Not. That's an imprinting one well, for me. It, and it that soundtrack be. was fucking everything that to me. That is a great it's soundtrack. It's so a great soundtrack. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, I'll give that to you. But Here. that's what what's happening, I think, sometimes yeah. with these movies. But for me, at that age, that made sense to me because that's what love made, was for me, you know, or the potential yeah. of love was like, I'm going to see a girl having an ice cream cone in the middle of the night somewhere, in the middle of nowhere, and I'm going to fall completely in love with her she doesn't know how good i'm gonna be for her mm. she, I'm, I'm gonna take such good care of her uh, i'll be nice to her i'll be you know the, all the fantasies of like that you have as a kid where you're gonna be the white knight riding on a maiden who needs you kind of thing that's what that looked like and felt like to me and i think miracle mile plays with that as well because he makes a lot of assumptions harry makes a lot of assumptions about this girl but he doesn't really actually know Mm -hmm. they, they they kind of see each other and stalk each other through the you know the, the small it's a very small in real life museum and and they uh don't know each other except that they're both kind of dorks i mean he 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 plays in a in a in a jazz band you know that that plays in the park to nobody and she wears a purple jumpsuit and carries pictures of herself on her to give to people that she's just met they're weird they're they don't fit with each other like when mm -hmm. she's late later when they don't fit with anybody else rather but later when she's Pushing her around in the in, in the shopping cart, which is a fascinating image. She gets out of it and her foot's asleep. She says, "Wake up! Come on, get!" Up. You know, that's something that someone who's been raised by elderly people does. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, yeah. And, and you look at this, you know, from the perspective of 2020, and you're like, "What is happening here? Who is that? What's going on?" Boy, the 80s were so stupid. It's like, no, in the 80s we we thought that was stupid. In the 80s mm -hmm. we're like, no, nah, I don't know anybody that dresses like this. You know, we watched Valley Girl, we watched Night of the Comedy, we watched those things, and we didn't actually know people who dressed like that. And mm -hmm. that was the amplification of what we were kind of playing around with. That's a, a lot. That was, that was a lot. So M Miracle Mile is sort of this, again, the sort of like, these two people don't fit anywhere else. Harry Washello is in his 30s. He's never met the girl of his dreams. And now he believes that he's met the girl of his dreams. 
and he's going to do whatever it takes. He's going to lie to her. He's going to kidnap her. He's going to do all sorts of stuff. He's going to hide the truth of the world from her. You know, as as if how presumptuous jerk. You know, no, she doesn't mm-hmm. need that from you. But he's going to do that because he's never grown out of this idea of what a romantic relationship looks like. So for me, in a lot of ways, Miracle Mile at the time, yeah, I'm going to find a girl and knock her out and put her in a shopping cart, <laughs> and I'm going to take her to a helicopter because <laughs> that's love, and we're going to love each other forever. When I look at it as a, you know now, I'm like, man, I like Harry less and less the more I watch this movie. I'm like, that guy, she deserves the truth. She mm-hmm. deserved to spend time with her grandparents. She deserved a different fate that he gave her. And if all he's promising her is a suffocating end where they'll be together forever. Yeah. And it's a really kind of subversive play on domesticity and the idea of what uh, becoming married does for a woman. And Hitchcock was doing the same thing with women in the 60s. Every time someone gets married or decides to do something that's domestic in one of Hitchcock's movies, they get punished by murder, by mm. rape, by uh, ca- 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 catatonia. Mm-hmm. You know, it's why, you know, Hitchcock was mostly studied by women when he was first being studied in the, in the United States. It's because he had a really clear idea of what society does to women. Miracle Mile does as well. And it, it, it may not be intentional. I don't think it was. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I would consider myself friends with Steve and everything. And he's always been like, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't really understand. This has been taken up as a as a queer film, you know, because he cast a a a, 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 a trans actor to be, you know, in the, in the diner. And he's like, I didn't intend that, you know. Danny was just the best actor, and I didn't intend this. I didn't intend this, and you know, I didn't intend to have you know Michael T. Williamson being the kid who steals the car radios and mm-hmm. stuff. Originally, it was written he was a white surfer dude, but Michael T. came in and blew us away. And I never considered the racial implications of having mm-hmm. a black guy stealing stereos and i'm sorry and he said that and i'm like i I believe you because in the 80s i was using the f word to refer to 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 gay people i was using the r word Mm -hmm. with my friends i was i was uh, gay was a pejorative all these things in the 80s for me were just among good kids that's just the language we use and we didn't mean it maliciously we meant it because that was like we said it because we were stupid we were ignorant Mm -hmm. we didn't appreciate the damage we're doing and we didn't believe that there was any kind of minority like that within a hundred yards of us ever. Mm-hmm. We were doing it because we were of a group. We were of that, you know, majority group. And it's like, I get it. I get why these things happen. And unpacking these movies now can be painful. Can you know, you watch Predator or you watch whatever. It's like you have these depictions, and you're like, you know, that's some of the work that I was doing with with Forty Eight Hours, the the Walter Hill film that uses the N word liberally. And I'm mm-hmm. like. What is happening in this movie, really? What is really being unpacked in this film? And is it grotesque? Yes. But is it also giving us something valuable, a portal in the 1982? I think so. And I think not, I think Miracle Mile gives us a portal into how men are <laughs> mm-hmm. in the worst possible light. And, you know, Near Dark gives us a portal into how society was responding to a collective unease about generational illness and AIDS, you know, that's sort of coming to light. You know, the year before Near Dark was... David Cronenberg's the, the Fly, which is largely about the same stuff, about disease and about aging and about decrepitude and all the stuff that was happening in our culture. And so we have a lot of stuff, right, it, uh, packed into these movies. And the subversion is a huge part of the movies of the 80s that we don't talk about enough. You know, we look at the 80s and we say blockbusters and big movies and, the you know, Jaws and Star Wars ruined movies forever. You know, the movies are great in the 70s. 80s is just garbage, just popcorn, mm-hmm. left and right, popcorn. Honestly, what is Back to the Future really about? About a guy that goes back in time, and his mom is a is is, is you know wild, she's mm-hmm. freaky, and her dad his dad is a peeping tom, and uh, the 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 friend that works for the family is a uh, rapist, and um, maybe things weren't as great in 1950 as we want them to be. I mean, the mm-hmm. whole all the stories that his parents tell in the beginning of the movie it was so romantic, it's so you know. In reality, when we get to see it, it's ugly and it's awkward and it's mm-hmm. horrible, and just like it's always been, same as it ever was. In the '80s, we have a president Reagan who wanted to take us back to the '50s and the way that we felt about ourselves in the '50s. You know, the, the, uh, go buy a new car. We're we're gonna go kill Russia. We're gonna do. You know, after the the the, the devastation of the '70s, the psychological devastation, Reagan was the feel good president. He wanted mm-hmm. all of us to feel better about stuff. And so, you know, the messages in these films. And the great ones like Predator, like RoboCop, like 
Back to the Future, you know, uh, these key movies for, from 1980s, Die Hard even, they're very subversive about what it means to be an American hero, what it means to think of America in a way that's, you know, a- exceptional. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I think Miracle Mile does that. I think Near, Near Dark does that. But I think any number of key films from the 1980s does that as well and does it beautifully. It's, it's a... It, 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 it's a time that I love, you know, I, I would love it unconditionally, even if it didn't do these things, but I believe that it does do some of these things. And that's, uh, that's really cool. <laughs> Part of why I love the idea of doing this series was because, um, I really value the co- the context of mm-hmm. like, it's, it's really hard to just be like, cool. I've never seen the Godfather, which I haven't. And like, you just put it on it would make so much more sense to me understanding the context of what was happening politically in the world at that moment. So like near dark, I was watching it. I didn't think about the AIDS crisis at all. That gives me a whole different lens to look at this movie that I previewed that I wouldn't have just on its own. And so like that I think is so instrumental when it's not just like films can be oppressive, right. And were oppressive. And even if it was a product of its time, it still caused harm, right, in those moments. But it's not just that, right? It's that it is coming out of a time and a place that is specifically responding to who we were as a society, what stories were allowed to be told and got the budgets to be told, and what our fears were and what what we were trying to hide even as a society in some of our films. Yeah, and it does that because it can't help but do that. It, it, it can't help but do it. It, 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 you know. And the the big pushback you'll get in classroom environments, it, you know, when, when when I teach some of this stuff is like, come on, are you trying to tell me that Catherine Bigelow was talking about the AIDS crisis? And you know, are you trying to tell me Walter Hill was talking about that in Streets of Fire? Are you? It's like, no, I don't know what they're talking about. They were just responding to their time. They were responding mm-hmm. to the things that that made them excited, or made them afraid, or made them whatever. I mean, horror movies are so valuable because they are the clearest, quickest conduit that we have into a whole cultures subconscious if a movie is deemed to be scary to be made it's saying something about what we're afraid of you know why are all these home invasion movies after 9 11 there's Mm -hmm. there's like 80 the next year what happened well obviously we know what happened why are are there giant bug movies in the 1950s or red scare movies in the 1950s why are there you know uh, body snatcher movies all the way through the 70s what's happening Mm -hmm. we know what's happening you know but the the real trick is to see the movies that are being released now the horror movies that are being released now and to ask yourself in 50 years, if we make it, if there's still a culture in 50 years, what will they be saying about these mm. movies? You know, and, and it's possible to see it. It's there. It's just difficult because there's all this noise, you know, that makes it difficult for us to see. But yeah, 1987 is the beginning of the AIDS crisis, is the beginning of, you know, is the the middle of, uh, you know, our, our, the end of the, the beginning of the end of the Cold War, mm. essentially. When, you know, uh, growing up, Ebony, you, you remember how scared we were every day of being vaporized. Yeah. You know, you know what you know a TV movie like The Day After, I think in 1985, I was so scared to look out the window after watching The Day After uh, uh, or Testament, uh, you know, these new, these nuclear movies. And you know, even 10 years later, I don't think kids grew up with the same kind of nuclear fear that we had. We mm-hmm. were afraid every day that Russia was going to kill us. Um and, and so we that sense of doom, the 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 storyline that it, it happens throughout Miracle Mile, that's the eighties. And one of the reasons that Steve thinks that um, the movie didn't do as well as, you know, they had all hoped that it would do when it was released was because the Berlin wall came down during the, t- be- between the time it was made and between the time it was released. Mm. So suddenly overnight, right. the nuclear fear went down. So mm-hmm. this became a fantasy instead of a real thing. But the year before Miracle Mile came out, there was a new twilight zone a- a series that came out on CBS. I think it was. And there was an a- a- episode of it where a woman finds a, 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 a an amulet that lets her stop time and start it again. Stop mm-hmm. and start, stop and start. And she stops it the last time with uh, an ICBM, a nuclear missile, about to hit her city. And she can never start it up again or else it's mm-hmm. the end of the world. That was the environment that we were living in, the end of the world, the end of times. And so we were looking at these movies. And you see the, sort of the same kind of stuff coming up in, in 1999, the movies in 98, 99, like mm-hmm. The Matrix, Dark City. You see a lot of that sort of nuclear and technological fear coming back but in the 80s throughout the course of the 80s you see that terror i mean where does marty get the the plutonium for uh his delorean and back to the future libyans terrorists mm-hmm. they stole it from them i mean there's the he he, he he wears a radiation suit 
you know, into the past. Mm -hmm. That was the 80s. It, we were terrified. We were fucking terrified. We we're going to get killed every single day. Yeah. So Miracle Mile had a very specific pulse. And, you know, I, I watched that movie every single day as I was, you know, kind of trying to not kill myself again. I After I got out of the mental hospital, my parents were like, you will never talk about this again. We'll never talk about this again. You're not getting therapy. You're fine. You're fine. Jeez. So I was like, well, I'm going to. I'm just going to go kill myself again. But instead of doing that, I started renting Miracle Mile at the local video store. Mm -hmm. Every three days, I just go back and renew it and I'd watch it over and over wow. and over again. And there was something so soothing about a movie about another guy who's wrapped up in an end of the world story that he wrote for himself. Mm. That he was part of something bigger. He was part of a big story. His life mattered. Mm -hmm. He played a role in it. And at the end of it, you might still end up at the bottom of the tar pits, but you'll be there with a girl who loves you back. And that's that helped me, <laughs> you know. That helped me yeah. not not mm -hmm. go through that again. And so uh, I'm I'm raving. I'm sorry, but yeah. No, no, please. I I have a slightly off and whatever t tangenty question, but I think about how some films that really made a huge impact on me are like smaller indie films that are probably not going to be like in conversations in 20, 30 years on podcasts, right? Was Near Dark and Miracle Mile, like you mentioned Miracle Mile didn't do as well. Like what were those movies like uh, popular? Were they like in theater? Like did they have big audiences? Like what what kind of environment did those live in at the time when they were released? No, they they, they weren't big movies, you know. In fact, um um uh, Mir Miracle Mile premiered at Sundance the same year that Heathers was there. Uh, and and stuff, but also the same year, I think, as Six Lives and Videotape, which sort of sucked all the air out of the room. I mean, mm -hmm. suddenly they're like, this is the new indie cinema. It's serious, but you know, mo vampire movies, you know, nuclear thrillers, these were never taken seriously. You know, it, they were never, and if it's not like a big Steven Spielberg production or whatever, people aren't really rushing to go see those movies either. You know, case in point, Ebony missed N Near Dark, which would mm -hmm. have been absolutely your jam if right. you're aware of it, right? And so, you know, these movies didn't really make a big impact. And, you know, also counting against Near Dark was that it's directed by a woman. Who wants to watch an action movie directed by a woman? So all of these things were, like, kind of working against it, working against it. And, and and you know, yeah, I, the, I wouldn't be so sure that the indie movies that you love aren't going to be the ones that are being talked about in 30 years. Mm. You know, I've always said, you know, when people say they don't make them like they used to, it's like, well, you're just ignorant. Because <laughs> we're actually making better films now than we've ever made. But... We're also making 600 other movies that you have to wade through to get to the 10 that we're going to be talking about in 80 years. Yeah. You know, the, the example I give, and I, you probably were, you know, done it in the course of your, of your series here, is that the best year in movies ever that most scholars agree is the best year in movies ever is 1939. It challenged you to name more than 10 movies from 1939. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I can get up to about- Or one. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this a really long time and I can do about 20 or so, mm -hmm. but- if we say, okay, I, I can give you 20 movies from the best year of movies ever, you know, Gone with the Wind, uh, Return of Jesse James, Wizard of the Lost, I, if, I'll just list them off. What were the other 600 movies that Hollywood made that mm -hmm. year? The garbage, the different levels of garbage. Time is the greatest curator of, of this. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that's really kind of ringing your bell right now. It's probably the stuff that in 80 years, TCM is going to be doing a retrospective. They're going to be doing the films of Rob Schneider. They're going to be doing, you know, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and mm -hmm. the films of Charlie Kaufman. And did, um, you know, Citizen Kane even win the Best Picture Oscar? No, the, the top grossing movie in the year Citizen Kane came out was, was The Egg and I. So there's a real disconnect between, uh, you know, what, what people are like, oh, I went to see a movie and it was terrible. We don't make them like... Okay, but there are 500 movies that are going to come out this year, yeah. just from this yeah. country. Um, did you actually see the the one of the 10 that are going to be curated through time as one of the great movies? I'm going to say no, mm -hmm. because people are neither rich enough to do it, have enough time to do it, or curious enough mm -hmm. to seek it out. But in a few years' time, we'll look back and we'll say, you know, from you know, if we look, look back in the 80s, we'll look back and we'll say, hey, you know what? Uh, Angel Heart is one of the best horror movies of all time. It came out in 1987 as well. Uh, it's Mickey Rourke and Robert De Niro. And, and, and like, why well, haven't you seen it? Um, Jacob's Ladder in the early 90s. Uh, you know, these are the movies that we will be talking about. Streets of Fire, mm -hmm. which flopped like crazy. We'll be looking back at these movies and not movies like Dead Poets Society and not movies like whatever. What is there more to say about Dead Poets Society? 
I love Peter Weir. Mm-hmm. What more is there to say about it? You know, it, it, if movies are a Rorschach test, so some movies are a Rorschach test with the answer. Like, hey, what do you see? And on the bottom, it says it's a bat. <laughs> you know, so, so there's there's not really a point to go mm-hmm. back to those. But but I can throw out a movie to you. It was super intelligent, culturally uh, intelligent, emotionally intelligent people, and say. Give a look at Near Dark and give a look at Miracle Mile. Let's have a conversation about the 80s around those two things. And you're going to come back at me with your experiences as a kid. You're going to talk to me about the 90s. You're going to talk to me about Romeo and Juliet, all of these things. Would that happen if I said, let's look at Dead Poets Society? No. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, some things are just, they tell you what they're about, and other movies are about something else. Yeah. That can only tell me about what you're about. I love that. I think. That's a great way to end this episode. Yeah. I love that. No, I really do love that. I think that that context is so important to like the history as a curator. And, and, um, and we see that too with the ways that like cult classics come out and like movies that you're just like, oh my God, everyone's obsessed with this movie all of a sudden. Thanks everyone for listening to Founders Frequency Radio. Walter, where can folks find your work or do you have anything you want to plug? Um, you, you know, most of my stuff goes directly to filmfreakcentral.net. It's a Canadian-based publication I've been writing for for 20-some years. I have a, I have a book by, about Walter Hill, the films of Walter Hill, uh, with an introduction by James Elroy and um, wow. uh, cover art by the Egyptian artist Ganzir. It's pretty cool. Uh, it, it's mm-hmm. coming out in, in the fall. I think pre-orders are open already. Um excited about that if you've not seen my episode of war the david fincher documentary series on netflix i did episode number six uh yeah. of that about 40 hours it was hours. great yeah uh, carolyn uh, carolyn thanks. plugged it at uh, an ep- uh previously on the podcast and i watched it It was really lovely oh that's very kind of her i love carolyn mm-hmm. so much um yeah it, it was fun to work with david fincher it's kind of it's kind of wild i had to yeah, yeah that's, a, that's yeah. A, anyway that's a long story too but uh <laughs> Yeah, but I we mean, got a bonus, yeah. which, you know, we can talk about <laughs> yeah, all kinds of things, yeah. including, I hope, Predator. Let's talk about Predator in the bonus. I want to I wanna get into that. Oh, I'm, but, I'm, I'm so in. Yeah, great. Um, Ebony, what, do you want to get anything to plug anywhere people yeah, can you find you? Yeah, you can argue with me on Twitter, at Ebony Astor. I won't respond, but go ahead and put your thoughts out into the universe. And um, you can also find out what I've been programming at Women in Film if you go to wif.org. And, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this little series that we put together this um, this season. We're taking a bit of a break, so we'll see you in a few weeks uh, on the next season. Our show is engineered by Rob Para. Carrie Stimson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.